All right, open your Bibles, please. Still in the book of Romans, chapter 5, looking at the results of justification. Thank you all this evening for being here. God bless you. Hope you've had a good day. It's hot, but I still like the sun. I'd rather have hot than cold I could tell this morning when I started working. It was still early, but I said, it's hotter today now than it was yesterday this time. <laughs> but, okay. The results of justification. We'll pick back up where we left off. Number one is peace so far. Peace with God. Number two, access. Number three, a standing. Being able to stand before God. Now, number four, we're going to talk about is hope. We'll start right there, or pick up right there, Lord willing. So let's read this again. Therefore, now I want to say something here because I'll, 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 I'll try to explain that here in a moment. This is the Apostle Paul. I want you to realize he's a Jew. Now, you may say, well, why are you saying that? Well, I'll tell you here in just a few moments the way certain things were worded and why certain things were said. Okay, because Jews were totally different in their culture than we are. Okay, remember, they're in the East, we're in the West. The Eastern culture and the Western culture is totally different. All right? Once you understand that. Okay? All right. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. By whom also we have access to by faith into this grace wherein we stand, number three, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, number four. Now I'm going to read through verse five. I want you to see this. Now, uh, Katrina, I say you got your Bible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember you saying that Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> rejoice in hope. I want you to online that word hope. Wherein we stand and is a conjunction. There again, he is not changing the subject. He is continuing thereon with the same subject. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, see there's that word and again. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. And knowing that tribulation worketh patience, produces perseverance. And perseverance, experience, or character. And character, hope. There's number two, same subject, two different times. Number five, and hope. Number three, maketh not a shame. Or does not make us ashamed because, the reason being, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, pay attention to that, which is given unto us. That means that He lavishly pours it upon us. Now, you see how things are worded? It makes all the difference in the world. Now, hope. I will uh, erase these first three and I'll put hope back up at the, because we went over these right here, but I want you to see those. Now, hope. I want you to think about that. Okay, now, this word right here means rejoice in hope means that you know what that means? It means that we can boast. 
Think about that. It means that we can boast in God. Now, boasting can be a very bad habit. <laughs> or it can be, but here is this refers to that we as Christians, by the grace of God, it don't mean that you're arrogant or cocky or boisterous. It means that you're proud because of you can boast or boast in God. Okay, that's what that means. Rejoice in God. All right? Now, I'm going to start out with a negative. If we might say a negative response. You know, hope is a wonderful thing. You know that? I don't have to tell you all that. You know that. Hope is a wonderful thing. But I'd like to ask you a question tonight. Are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? Because believe me, over the years I've met a lot of pessimist people. <laughs> and I personally don't misinterpret that. I just do not care for pessimistic or pessimism. I just don't. I think that by the grace of God, we should always try to look forward to the best because we know we have something better to look forward to. Right. Even a Christian living in our society today, you and I, brother, can boast in the fact of knowing that we have something better to look forward to, okay? Now, I read one time a doctor making a remark about people being in the hospital who are sick. He said, doctors could tell them that they're going to get better. But he said, when a person even knows that they can get better, but they lose hope, you know what happens? They die. Mm -hmm. yeah. They die. He said, hope is a wonderful thing, which it is. Mm -hmm. And you and I, amen. You know, even in everyday walk of life, I know that we have heaven to look forward to. I know that. But even in everyday walk of life, we hear bad things happening. I still look, personally speaking, I still look to something better. It'll be better, you know. Mm -hmm. And it will be. But I want to show you something. As I said, I'm going to start out with a negative response. This is the Old Testament. Turn to the Old Testament. The book of Ezekiel. I want to read 14 verses of Scripture because I want you to see this. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. And this is the valley of dry bones. This is in reference to the nation of Israel. Okay? And I know we've come out of Ezekiel. We studied, what, one or two lessons in Ezekiel? Yeah. Talked about the two sticks. And, and I remember Katrina talking about the two sticks. Yes, that's, that's part of this chapter right here. Okay. The Valley of Dry Bones. This is the prophet Ezekiel. Now remember now, in the captivity, there were three captivities. Mm -hmm. One in 605, one in 589, or 598, and the other one in 587. Now, during the, during the 605 B.C., the first time, uh, Ezekiel was carried away by the Babylonians. In 598, Daniel was carried away. Then in 586, the rest of them were carried away. But this prophet right here has been in Babylon longer than the others. So he is a prophet, and God speaks to him, and he is preaching or prophesying to the people who are in Babylon, the Jews. Now... Follow with me. I'm going to give you a negative response here. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. He's referring to the nation of Israel. And caused me to pass by them round about and behold they were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry. See? And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Mm -hmm. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones. In other words, tell the people of Israel that you're preaching or prophesying. And he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, this is future. Okay? Now, I want you to see something here. 
This is future. The Hebrews had two tenses for time. You in the West have three. <laughs> we have a past. We have a present. And we have a future. The Hebrews never considered this. They lived in the past and they looked to the future. They said the present was fleeting so fast that they never gave it no mind. Now if you realize, all these men that I'm telling you about are Jews. Mm -hmm. So they either write about the past or they're writing about the future. So Ezekiel, what's he talking about? He's looking to the future. He's trying by the grace of God to give these people hope. Hope. Now, that's very, I think that's very important personally. I want you to understand that. Okay? Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, or life, or spirit, and you, see, see that word? You shall live. That's future. Mm -hmm. And I will lay muscle or sinews upon you. And bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the, the muscle and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no spirit in them or breath. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say unto the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. Now that's pretty significant, you realize? North, east, west, south. That God's going to bring them from all over the world back to Jerusalem. And whether you realize that or not, it's happening every day up to this point. And it has been since 1948. Okay? I find that so interesting. <laughs> So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. You see? It's future. You see all this? So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up on their feet an exceeding great army. Now if you study the history of the, Israel, of the Jews today, 1967, Yom Kippur War, the War of Independence, you realize that the Jews have never been defeated. Mm -hmm. And there's less than 4 million Jews in Jerusalem and Israel at this time, but they are surrounded, and I told you that, they're surrounded by Asia, Africa, and Europe, and they're a little country, so to speak, no bigger than New Jersey, and they have been surrounded numerous times, and they have never been defeated. I'm reading a book right now written by Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the Prime Minister from 2009-2021. I'm telling you, I, I, when I start reading it, it, it's amazing. I mean, I don't know any other thing to tell you other than it's amazing. It, that book is so amazing. I'll say it like that. This gentleman has went back 3,500 years, and of course he's a Jew, naturally. He's went back 3,500 years, and he has got more history and how all this has taken place, World War I, World War II, the Independence War, 1948. He goes back to Abraham. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I'll say it like that. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, have you got it? No. Oh, Lord, it's, it's amazing. Well, I get done reading, I'll let you borrow it. <laughs> but as I said, ugh, I, I, I love that book. Of course, his brother, uh, you all realize that all Jews have to serve two years in the army. Well, he served five years. 
him, his brother, and his younger brother all served. He was a commander. His brother was killed. If you saw the movie, uh, he was killed. He was the first Jew killed in the Battle of Entebbe where he rescued the, Jew, the Israeli soldiers. He goes into that. His brother was the one you find laying on the tarmac in the movie. His brother was the one that was laying there. He, he was killed. He was one great soldier. I'll say it like that. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones, see, these bones are, what? The whole house of Israel. And behold, they say, look at here, they say, our bones are dried, what's the next words? And our hope is lost. You see? We're in a strange land, brother. Our bones dried, our hope's lost. Ah, oh, I didn't want God said. <laughs> <laughs> Looking to the future. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore, therefore, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you, where? Into the land of Israel. And you shall know what? That I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your what? Own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Thus saith the Lord God. So what I want to say is, when you talk about a blessing or a result of justification, you have hope. And hope means we can boast in God. But yet, I wanted to take you back to the Old Testament Here's Paul, a Jew. He's writing all naturally to all Christians, Jew and Gentile. But here is a negative response to hope. Our hope is lost. Our bones are dried. Okay? Now, go to the book of Psalm for just a moment. As I said, I want to show you some negative responses to hope. And you say, you probably heard this, and yet it's true. You, but have you heard people say, or maybe you've said it, said, there's always hope. Which there is. There's always hope. Okay? If you have God. Yeah, yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. 137. Look at here. I want you to see this. This is only nine verses. Maybe I won't read it all, but here's what I want you to see. Here's another negative response. By the river, here again, the, the Jews in exile in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How, look here, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They've given up hope. Mm -hmm. Now look here, if I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her coming. Children, let me say something. There's lots of people say that the church has replaced Israel. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. No, no, no it's not. Don't misinterpret me. There's only one church, Jew and Gentile. But what I'm saying is, prophetically speaking, God is not yet done with the nation of Israel. That is future. Okay? If you read the book of Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, my goodness gracious, it is as plain as the nose on your head. God is not done. All you got to do is read the Old Testament prophets. It's not done. Okay? Now, go back to the book of Romans. If you would please. Now I want to give you some uh, positive. <laughs> now I'm going to give you a positive. Positive results or remarks or something by the grace of God to look forward to. Positive results. Remember now, same book, same people, same writer, the Apostle Paul, but I find this to be so interesting. 
Romans chapter 8, I'm going to start reading in verse 18. This is Paul. For I reckon, or I suppose, you see how that's a personal pronoun? That the sufferings in this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory, what did he say, which shall be revealed. Now, that's not present. That's future. You see the wording? What chapter are you in? Romans 8, starting in verse 18. Which shall be revealed in us. Children, always remember, in this world, you're going to have trouble. This is a sinful world. Sin. The reason you see all this turmoil, aggravation, is because of sin. Christians, we, we are saved by the grace of God. God loves us. He takes care of us. But we do have aggravation. We have difficult moments. But we have something better than this to look forward to. He said, what did he say? Shall be. Remember, the Jews never used the word present. They used the past and the future. <clears throat> well, Maybe. In the present, too. Exactly. But what they was, what they're thinking was, it's fleeting so fast that we don't even consider it. We have something better to look forward to. Yeah. And the past is very Yes, important. yes. Yes. For the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation. Now look here. Waiteth for the manifestation, see, of the sons of God. That's Christians. For the creation was made subject to vanity or futility, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath what? Subjected the same in hope. There's that word again. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now you stop and think about that for a moment. You stop and think of the hurricanes, the volcanoes. You stop and think of the floods. Look at the eastern part of the United States right now. It's covered with water. Look how many times Florida's been here. Look at the tsunamis. He said, for the creation itself waiteth in expectation for the future of the sons of God. In other words, if you read 2 Peter chapter 3, even God is going to change this and make it just like it was in the Garden of Eden. Amen. See, that's what I want you to see. As a Christian brother, you have that hope and you can boast. In God. That's all. Rejoice in God. All right. <laughs> because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, look here, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting, there's the hope, for the adoption to witness the redemption of our body. Won't it be amazing? You won't get old. <laughs> <laughs> Stop and think about that. Look at here. I want you to pay attention to these two verses right here. For we are saved by what? Hope. hope. But, pay attention how he words that. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? If you see something, then it's not hope. <laughs> You're looking for something you can't see. That's hope. Okay? Or you're waiting for something that ain't there. But if we hope, you see how he words it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now look at here. Look at here. Even in this present age, right now. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Ain't you glad? Yes, he does. 
For we know not what we should pray for as we should or ought, but the Spirit itself, that should be Himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And children, oh my, don't you find that overwhelming? <laughs> or I do. I'll say it like that. All right? And what are the next question? <laughs> now, when you get down into this one, yeah, there you there. I call this, when I get right here to Romans 8, 28, all the way through, chat, going into, starting at the end of chapter 11, I call this some of the deepest doctrine you've ever studied read in your life. Which it is. And I don't know why people can't see it, but the majority of people don't see it. And I'm not saying that to be critical, but what I'm saying is, and I don't want to get away from the subject, but what I'm saying is, children, God is in control and He's sovereign. I got you to realize one thing. God is ruling this universe. God sits on the throne. God's the governor, not human beings. Once you get that in your mind and you know that, I believe you can take life a lot easier. I really do. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just really hard to... Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John MacArthur, which I find him to be one of the greatest teachers there ever was, biblically, I mean, I, that man is spectacular in my opinion. Him and R.C. Sproul, they were really, 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 really good friends. R.C. Sproul was a Presbyterian minister. Of course, he's passed away now, but I'm telling you, these guys, and Dr. John MacArthur, you know what he called the doctrine of predestination, which is biblical. He teaches it, preaches it. He said it's a dangerous doctrine. Because honestly, if somebody would get in the pulpit and say, God chose, elected you, and only the elect will be saved, I guarantee 99.9% .9 of people in the congregation, well, you just told a flat out lie, buddy. No, he didn't. He told a flat out truth. Because it's biblical. Yeah, that's where the hot topic <laughs> That's why he calls it a dangerous doctrine. Because there again, 99.9% .9 of Christians do not believe that. They think they have something to do with it. They don't. They do not. Amen. <laughs> oh, I want to show you something else. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians. Along the line of hope, which I find this very interesting. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 16 through 18. Look at here. Here again, Paul the, 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 the Jew, the writer. For which cause we faint not, but... Now he's contrasting. But though our outward man, what? Perish. Which is so true. Is perishing. Or do not lose heart. If you go back up for a few seconds. But yet, yet what? The inward man is renewed, is renewed day by day. Mm -hmm. For our light affliction, which is but for a what? Moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. Look at here in verse 18. Now this is hard for a human to do. <laughs> While we look not at the things which are seen, it's hard to do, any children? But at the things which are not seen, there's a difference between a pessimist and an optimist. <laughs> for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. Amen. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. I don't know about you. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay. <laughs> Go to the book of Hebrews. I want to show you something. The book of Hebrews, chapter 3. 
Hebrews 3, 6. Paul again, well, no, I'll rephrase that. I don't think Paul wrote this, but this, this gentleman that did write this was highly, I, I used the word intellectual, educated. He knew the Jews' history. He knew, he, had, he was really sharp, I'll say it like that. But Christ, see, contrast, as a son over his own house, that's who we are, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence, that's perseverance of the saints, and the rejoicing of what? Of the hope firm unto the end. In other words, one of the doctrines of a Christian, he's stating right here, is we persevere. And we do, and that's what he's saying. And look here, rejoicing, what Paul said, we rejoice in hope. What's the writer saying here? Rejoicing in the hope, firm unto the end. Amen. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. I want you to see this. We say to rejoice in hope. I want to read something to you. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 13. I'm going to read through verse 20. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, persevered, he obtained the promise. Now, children, one of these days, by the grace of God, we will obtain, obtain the promise. Amen. That's hope. That's something to look forward to. And I like what the Bible says. You go back to the book of Romans chapter 4. If you read about Abraham, he just came as an illustration. He said he endured as not being able to see him. Pay attention to that because here in a moment I'm going to show you something. He patiently endured as not seeing him, yet he believed. Hard to believe something you can't see in it. <laughs> really? I mean, honest. But pay attention here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you something here in just a moment. He patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men truly or verily swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation to them, an end of all strife or dispute. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs, you see that? A promise, the immutability or the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation, pay attention here, who have fled for refuge to lay hold what? upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. In other words, Jesus entered the presence of God and he sits on the right hand and he makes intercession for the saints. I want you to pay attention to verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, where the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you a question right here. Remember, as I said in Romans chapter 4 where it talks about Abraham, he endured as not able to see him, but yet he believed and trusted. <laughs> and he received the promise, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Now, you read this, let me read it to you again. I want you to, I want you to underline this. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth within the veil. How many times have you all ever heard, or have you ever heard, the song, The Anchor Holds? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that song. Yes. The Anchor Holds. And it does, don't it? Yes, it does. Now, 
Anchor. When I say anchor, what would be the first thing that comes to your mind? Anchor. All ships going across the ocean, no matter if you're a fishing boat, don't they, have, don't they all have anchors? Yes, they do. Wait. And an anchor is for the very purpose of holding the ship during a storm. In other words, it may rock back and forth, it don't move. It keeps it steady. Now, Pay attention. Abraham patiently endured as not being able to see him, but yet he found an anchor on a ship. You don't ever see it. You don't see an anchor on a ship. You ever stop to think about that? But it's there. Okay. And it's only used in a storm. And brother, the anchor, what did Paul say, or the writer, the writer say, both both sure and what steadfast the anchor holds you see you see how this is how the writer is worded this of course they were what led by the Holy Spirit Exactly. And you can believe one thing, as I said this, I'll repeat it. You can believe one thing, or you can believe a lot of things, but all believe this, which hope we have as security, that's positive, as the reason an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast and enters within the veil. I hear people say sometimes, I know you've heard it, well, how do you get through what you get through? Well, there again, I go back to this right here, the unseen hand. It's kind of like, I think I mentioned this probably sometime last year, I think I did, but it's kind of like you don't need the grace until you get on the train. If you get on the train, God's going to give you the grace. I do a lot of thinking about, I mean, well, There's people that go through difficulty in life, children on a daily basis. I mean, I remember in 1979, Woody and Phyllis had their accident. That was one of the most horrible times, personally speaking, in my life. Now, you go to a hospital and you're your legs are broke from your waist down to your feet and your pelvic is crushed and your ribs are crushed your kneecaps are crushed they're gone and you sit there and you're and you you, you listen to these two people that, that are your family and you hear them moan and groan in pain and you're sitting there and my goodness gracious you can't do anything, you can't do anything. and the doctors come in and the nurses come in and they'll say your mom and dad will never walk again <laughs> you know yeah. And of course, by the grace of God, and I'll never forget, Minnie Reed was here at this church the night it happened on a Sunday night in September of 1979. And when we went home, we got the call for Brother Jimmy Barney, uh, Jimmy Barney, Jimmy Motes uh, was here. And I'll never forget that one of the greatest things that I'll never forget is when I walked out of the emergency room to go outside. I saw Johnny Jackson, I saw Jimmy Motes. And there were others, but I can't remember all. They were all circled, and they were holding hands. And they were praying. I'll never forget that. And I remember one of the uh, people came in and said, uh, the day or two, uh, 
he was a very arrogant, he didn't know anything at all about nothing. He thought he did. He had a title in front of his name. That's about it. And he walked in and he said, uh, your mom and dad are some kind of living in an illusion that uh, God's going to take care of. He said, and Aurelia really stopped him right there. I'll never forget that. She stopped him right there and stuck her finger right in his face. And my wife ain't that type of person. She said, you, you shut up. You've said enough. She said, you can get out now. She said, there will be one reason my mom and dad will get out of this hospital, and it's God, it's not you. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. Now, it took nine months. I'm telling you, nine solid months, brother. But they walked. But they walked. And that was the grace of God. And it was the grace of God. And that is, as we once say, perseverance. And you know it was for his glory too, because everyone that knew about it knew it was exactly. Good. And hope. The turn. I'm telling you. There was a, there was a lady. Of course, this has been quite a few years ago. It's been 44 years ago, I think. Up to this point right here. But I'll never forget that when that happened, that Janice Thompson, which in the community I grew up, that's where it happened at the wreck, the accident. She was the person to meet Woody and Phyllis when they had the accident. She said, the closer I got, the louder he prayed. She said, I've never heard a man pray like that. Even in that midst of that, brother, he was calling out to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll quit. <laughs> <laughs> Lord willing, let me say it like this. We'll pick back up where we left off, okay? I thank you guys. For your time, your attention. God bless you.